McClory, Kevin McClory. Don't recognize the name? Few people do. Yet he had one of the biggest impacts on the biggest spy franchise in history. Before Marvel, before Star Wars, there was James Bond, the original movie franchise. This is the story of a man obsessed with everyone's favorite spy, a man who wanted him for his own and was punished for his ambition to become the man who would be Bond. Welcome to our new series, where each episode, we bring you along as we learn the craft and uncover the truths behind the mysteries of Hollywood. This is Hollywood Uncovered. I am LRM online contributor and your host, Anthony Steves, and I'm joined by uh, Jammer, one of the producers and writers of the series, as well as one of the hosts of Breaking Geek Radio, the podcast. I am uh, James W. Burns. I'm the producer director of the series. And although you may not see me as much because I'm more behind the scenes, I'm very excited to be involved and, and kind of shepherd this along. So obviously I'm a James Bond fan, but I can't say I'm the biggest James Bond fan. So what we're talking about today is something that I really didn't know much about. I saw hints of this mystery that we're talking about here, but it was kind of under the surface. You know, I saw it in things like Spectre, the organization disappearing after Diamonds Are Forever. So it's kind of a question that I didn't even realize I had. Why did Spectre disappear? Um, and there's a whole interesting, intriguing story I know behind the scenes. And it's something that Anthony, you delved into. So what exactly did you do to get started on unraveling this mystery? Well, to find out more about why that happened and how it happened, I needed to go back to one of the creators of James Bond. No, not just Ian Fleming, but Kevin McClory. Hey, I'm Mark A. Altman, and I'm the author of Nobody Does It Better, the complete unauthorized, uncensored oral history of James Bond, and it's a complete history of the entire James Bond saga and spy mania. So for people who are who know nothing about it, where does James Bond begin? Yeah, well, I mean, you had Ian Fleming, who uh, was a veteran of uh, World War II and the, the uh, Secret Services and uh, in MI6 um, during the war. During that process, he conjured up the ultimate secret agent, a man who was uh, you know, irresistible uh, to women who drank too much and basically was the world's greatest spy, you know, which is, you know, Ian sort of saw himself as his doppelganger. And then when he launched the books, they became very, very successful. And like any big novel, people wanted an adaptation. Ian Fleming was looking for anyone and everyone to make his dream of Bond on the silver screen a reality. He brought out a rubber stamp at a red ink pad. M opened the pad, tamped the rubber stamp on it, and then carefully pressed it down on the gray cover. He turned the docket round and pushed it gently across the desk to Bond. The red sans serif letters, still damp, said, for your eyes only. Yeah, so basically have a situation where like anyone who came to Ian Fleming who said he had money and could make these movies, like he's making deals left and right. So he was approached through a mutual friend. Uh, Kevin McClory had just done a movie called The Boy in the Boy on the Bridge, I think it was. He said, look, I want to direct this. I want to make this, you know, and, um, and uh, I believe in James Bond. And so Fleming is immediately captivated by this guy who by all rights was a very charismatic guy. They decide rather than trying to adapt an existing Fleming property, they're gonna develop a new story, James Bond of the Secret Service. McClory was the child of two actors, so one could say that he was born to be a star. Like Fleming, he was a veteran of World War II and later went on to be involved in films, even directing his own movie. He was a driver who traveled the world and a playboy by all accounts. Even being rumored with actresses like Elizabeth Taylor, he was basically a very Bond-like figure himself. Mr. Bond. James Bond. When the opportunity came to make a movie about a spy that he could relate so much with, he went in head first. Developing the script with Fleming and another screenwriter named Jack Whittingham, his movie-making dreams seemed to become reality, and it was even a character that he may have felt a deep connection to. Uh, my name is Sylvan Whittingham, and uh, I'm the daughter of Jack Whittingham who is the man who wrote the first James Bond screenplay uh, in 1959, long before all the others were written. He was approached 
by Kevin McClory to write a screenplay using the character of James Bond with Ian Fleming's permission. It came out as the fourth film, but it was the first screenplay that was shown to Sean Connery and it was the first planned film, it just that it, it was held up. And before he came to Bond, he was considered, at that point, he was considered one of England's top 10 screenwriters. The Bond books in those days, it was a series of books that basically schoolboys liked to read. So at the time, I was um, disappointed because my father was being wooed by Disney at the time. Then uh, Kevin McClory came onto the scene Kevin, as you know, was the man who got the whole thing started and rolling. Everything was going ahead. I mean, all sorts of details had been planned. As far as we knew, it was all going ahead. Everyone was thrilled. Fleming was thrilled with the screenplay. We've got lots of notes saying how pleased he was with what Daddy was doing. While the screenplay by Whittingham seemed to be well received, seeds of doubt started to creep in. Over time, Fleming starts to have his doubts about McClory and his ability to direct and his ability to get this made and his connections to Hollywood. And um, then, so he starts looking at other opportunities, uh, but uh, it takes what they developed for this book, this uh, for this movie script uh, with Jack Whittingham and McClory and ends up uh, turning into the book Thunderball. Kevin turned up in shock to say that Fleming had brought out a novel. So by then, uh, uh, it was two wonderful uh, producers, an American producer, uh, Cubby Broccoli and um, Harry Saltzman, who had teamed up because Saltzman had the rights uh, to the Bond books, which was rapidly running out. And he needed a partner who could get them made in finance in order to up, re-up the option. And uh, Broccoli was that guy. And then they went to Columbia where Broccoli had a deal. They agreed to do the movie and uh, it was going to be Thunderball. It ended up being Dr. No because, of course, Thunderball had become involved in a tangled web of litigation. <laughs> by this point, Kevin McClory and Jack Whittingham were saying, hey, you based this whole book on this storyline that we all conceived together and we want uh, and you didn't even give us credit. And, you know, uh, you know, so it was, it's, it's some rotten in Denmark. And a lot of people say it was that lawsuit that contributed to Ian Fleming's early death because he was so stressed out over the whole thing. I, I think it was more the alcohol and the smoking, but you know, look, that might have been a part, yeah. <laughs> Turning our attention back to the lawsuit in question that may have contributed to Fleming's early death, one has to wonder, how much merit did it truly have? Well, I've got a copy of it here. This was the copy used in the in the court case. In here is all the, the underlinings, you know, of the all the pages that were stolen from the screenplay. This one, you know, those those li those lines down the side, I mean, all of that was taken. Some was Kevin's idea, some was Dad's idea, some was whoever. But it, it, there's 105 pages in that book that were lifted from that screenplay. Here we are. Those are the pages. Those are the pages that, wow. that, that are plagiarizing the screenplay. Uh, it says 105 pages out of 254, substantially film story. Based on the sheer amount of evidence, it's hard to conclude that what Fleming did was anything short of plagiarism. But we can't forget that while McClory may have been the producer spearheading things, he was not alone in his struggle to realize James Bond on the big screen. While McClory was surely getting cheated by Fleming, he wasn't the most innocent bystander himself with writer Jack Whittingham seemingly all but disappearing from this story by most accounts. Kevin threw in a few ideas. Anyone can chip in a few ideas, but my father sat in his office in his study for a year writing up till three o'clock in the morning sometimes. Um, and Kevin would like to make out, bless his heart, that he wrote the screenplay as well, but he was not a screenwriter. He wasn't a writer. To be fair, Ian Fleming um, and James Bond are obviously James Bond, it belongs to Ian Fleming. But there was a different Fleming yeah. in the books. Not everyone agrees with me on this, but I believe that screenplay was the pivotal point at which the screen character of James Bond was born. He's very like my father, playboy, charming with the ladies, and um, funny, humorous. That, that was the key to the success. That was the key to the success. 
what cannot be denied is that before my father's screenplay, nobody was interested in the Bond franchise. And after my father's screenplay, it's been sent around to everybody, they were. At the beginning of the case, he had gone in as a co-plaintiff with Kevin. They were suing jointly. Kevin was suing for plagiarism of his, he owned the screenplay, he paid my father for it. My father was suing for damages. But what happened was, he realized that Kevin had everything to gain and nothing to lose from suing Fleming. He owned the screenplay. My father, on the other hand, did not own the screenplay. If he lost, the costs would be astronomical. His costs would be astronomical. And so he stepped down as co-plaintiff and became principal witness. Kevin won the court case, or well, it was settled. It was settled anyway. And uh, my father then had his own court case sort of to follow in the wake for damages, but unfortunately, Fleming died shortly after those papers were were posted. And you cannot sue a dead man for plagiarism. And so that was the end of that. In the meantime, that screenplay had been seen. Fleming had sent it to Swartzman and Broccoli, and they'd seen that first screenplay. Now they could bring out the books because they they had that in, that screenplay influence now the books and so Doctor No was chosen and um, it started to take off. Thunderball being the legal spiderweb that it was, Doctor No was adapted instead, starting a string of hits with From Russia with Love and the major success of Goldfinger leading to a spy movie craze. Everyone wanted a piece of the action, and there was even alternate Bond movies being made, with the Casino Royale rights being held elsewhere and turned into a comedy. I'm beginning to think you're a trifle neurotic. The producers suddenly saw a major issue with McClory, possibly making his own Bond as well. Maybe it could survive one alternate movie with the character, but two seemed like a death sentence. So what, what are they gonna do? Um, you know, they can't have Kevin McClory running off with Thunderbolt making a competing franchise. Uh, it was the same thing, you know, their old uh, manager, a studio, uh, a studio head, Charlie Feldman, had uh, the rights to Casino Royale. And they're like, oh my God, so Charlie's gonna go off and make Casino Royale. Uh, McClory's gonna go make Thunderball, and we're gonna be left with this franchise that's gonna have no value because they're gonna destroy the brand. So that they make a devil's bargain. They make a deal with Kevin McClory to produce Thunderball. I think there were three Bond movies out by, by the time the court case finished. And it was becoming very, very successful. And for Kevin to go into competition with this would have been stupid, you know. So he did a deal with Swartzman and Broccoli to produce Thunderball. Okay. And um, left my father way behind. He didn't even sort of say goodbye. He didn't look back. So they make this deal with McClory and uh, they go off and, and shoot Thunderball. But the crazy thing that they did, and this, this leads us to you know today's show, is they make a deal and saying he gets the rights to remake Thunderball at, back after 10 years. I think he got the point. Hindsight is twenty twenty. This lack of foresight with their own franchise and the success it would become would cost them dearly. One of the worst decisions, most short-sighted decisions, because the second, the second it's 10 years go by, Kevin McClory is obsessed with remaking Thunderball and doing his own James Bond movie because he fancied himself a bit of a James Bond himself. And Chase Bond and McClory did. In 1976, McClory went on to announce an original Bond film, which very clearly stepped outside of his legal parameters. And uh, that's the beginning of the sort of you know, uh, saga that eventually led to Never Say Never Again. Sean Connery is Ian Fleming's James Bond in Never Say Never Again. He thought, because he got the rights to a couple of concepts that they had come up with for the book, along with Thunderball, that he had the freedom to sort of, you know, do anything he, 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 he wanted. Things had been getting out of control. Nobody was sure of where they stood legally on what film they could make, and McClory was just getting grander and grander ideas for his Bond. Someone had to rein it all in. Eventually, it would be a problem because when they were making Never Say Never Again, uh, the only way it got financed 
was a guy named Jack Schwartzman came in and then he brought in a team of lawyers and they were vetting every draft of the script to make sure that it hewed much more closely the Thunderball because they figured that was the only way that the film could get released and be guaranteed that they wouldn't get sued or an injunction to prevent the release of the movie. But during the, as he went along, I know in 86, he, he was looking for, he was asking me if I had any jottings or, or scraps from my, or diaries of my father's, because if it had just been one line in there, he might have been able to use it for a new film, you see. Ultimately, the resulting product, Never Say Never Again, a film starring Sean Connery that is Thunderball and pretty much everything but name. And for the production, Connery's involvement was a huge get that lended credence to the film. Eventually, he was very cagey in that he hired him as writer, knowing that if Sean got excited about the script, he could flip him into playing Bond. And then for a long time, Charlie Feldman was trying to get, it's interesting, the people he wanted from the Bond movies were Sean Connery and John Barry, the composer. Those are the two people he really wanted. He would only get Connery, and eventually Never Say Never Again would hit theaters. Fans were overjoyed at the idea of the original Bond being back. And you know, and then you go see Never, Never Say Never Again, you're like, yeah, when's the next Roger Moore movie coming out? <laughs> <laughs> My name is Bond. Oh, you're Mr. Bond. I believe I'm having you in half an hour. Oh, splendid. Your room or mine. McClory had his Bond film, but it was a disappointment. The 80s would go on, and there would be fits of starting and stopping for years with tons of legal battles every step of the way. McClory would keep trying to get his Bond to be made. Then, you know, the, the rights to Casino Royale bounce around for years, and you know, it's not until MGM UA and, 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 and the Eon settles their litigation with Sony that they finally get the rights back to Casino Royale, which, but it was part of a very complicated rights settlement, which again leads back to McClory because there was a point in, you know, the late 90s where John Calley, who had run United Artists, went over to Sony. And then he acquires all of McClory's rights to do Bond movies. And he says, okay, we're going to do our own own Bond movie to compete with United Artists and then UA sues them. And then as a result, there's this sort of um, it, 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 it seismic shift in terms of major franchises that we still feel today. Because basically Sony eventually settles and what uh, United Artists gets in return are, are all the rights they had to Never Say Never Again. So that's why now they're, they're able to put Never Say Never Again out. What does Sony get? Sony gets all of MGM's rights in Spider-Man. And just like that, you have an obscure court case from the 60s result in a seismic shift of franchise that would have effects for decades to come within the industry. But even while this deal with Spider-Man and Sony had gone down, you still had Kevin McClory forever chasing that white whale. He keeps trying to do Warhead, and he feels his, the mistake of Never Say Never Again, which he really didn't have much to do with once Schwartzman took over. One can't help but wonder, why couldn't McClory just make his own spy franchise. He's chasing his dream. <laughs> right, you're right. James Bond, and it's like, it's crazy. So it's like Warhead, 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 and then he's gonna do Spectre, you know, and then he was gonna do, you know, Spectre as a movie, and it's just, it's nuts. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> give it up. Go do your own movie. Um, you're absolutely right. He was obsessed. Because it's, it is strange why, you know, he made so much money out of Thunderball. He had 50% of the profits. Uh, why he didn't just go on and make some other movies. No one can understand that, really. I, I don't know if you know that Kevin was, uh, Kevin's ship in, was torpedoed. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. And he was in, uh, he was working on a, a ship in some war, I, I don't know which one, way back. And it was torpedoed. And they ended up in an open life, life raft, about 18 men, for two weeks open at sea and by night they froze and by day they scorched in the sun and their feet were in water for two weeks. Some of them died and were pushed overboard and when they finally rescued them, Kevin couldn't walk because his legs had swollen up for being in the water, it had swollen up that big and he couldn't talk, he couldn't talk at all. The Norwegian skipper, they had to cut the tiller from his hand because he'd been holding it for two weeks, oh. the tiller. Anyway, Kevin was taken to hospital and he had a lot of psychiatric treatment. He was obviously in deep shock. And um, he spoke again, but he always had a stammer from that point. He always had a stammer. I think he became so determined to survive and to, 
you know, I don't know. I think that just made him very one directional, perhaps. He never made another Bond film again. Eventually, he passed on in 2006. His estate then had control of his rights and eventually a deal was reached. In 2013, MGM made a deal and the war for Bond finally ends. So what's going on, James? They say you're finished. What do you think? I think you're just getting started. That's when they get the right to the Spectre and finally this long, you know, thing that lasted over four decades, this war, this, 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 you know, for Bond, the war for Bond, it really was a war. They finally have all the rights now vest with the family and with United Artists. They have the rights to Spectre, they have the rights to Casino Royale, they have the rights to, you know, Never Say Never Again. Um, so it's all finally under one roof and, and there's no chance that anyone else can make a Bond movie. Though while this story may seemingly have a happy ending from the perspective of many fans eager to see all the rights fall under one roof, we can't forget the human cost of it all. Everyone walked away unhappy. Peter never got paid (laughs) by Kevin. Kevin, disastrous. Well, I mean, yes, I think he was pretty broke at the end. He was pretty broke at the end. If you like, you know, if you like what Eon and the family has done with Bond, then it has a happy ending. If, if, if you would have liked to have seen another interpretation of Bond, then it's sort of a, a, a sad tale. In my writing, there's a picture of me and Dad there. That's me and my dad. And, um, but I want to read you what it says at the back. Yes, this is, this is what it says. Towards the end. Every so often, the law shakes off its cobwebs to produce a story far too improbable even for the silver screen. Too fabulous, even for the world of 007. This is one of those occasions, for the case before us has it all. And that was said by a US judge's 2001 summing up of Kevin McClory's 40 year dispute over the parentage and ownership of the movie James Bond. McClory's undying obsession with the James Bond character can possibly be summed up by one quote from James Bond himself. Because once you've tasted it, that's all you want to drink. (laughs) Please like and subscribe to this series and keep your eyes peeled for our next installment. Until then, you can follow me on Twitter at The Azorian One, as well as Jammer at Jam the Writer and James at Indie underscore Filmmaker. And obviously we couldn't do this episode without the help of our guests. First of all, I'd like to thank Mark A. Altman for taking time to speak with us. You can find his book, Nobody Does It Better, the complete, uncensored, unauthorized oral history of James Bond on Amazon. And there's a link to that in the description below. And I'd also like to thank Sylvan Whittingham, without which we couldn't have done this episode. Um, She has a book on Amazon as well, The Thunderball Story, the untold history of the first James Bond screenplay that was written by Jack Whittingham. We'll see you next time. Hey, thank you so much for watching. We greatly appreciate the support. Also, if you're looking for more content like what you just watched, go check out John Reverse. John Reverse. The link is in the description of the video you just watched. Go click on it now.